Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday night's BE class. I am in the front foyer of the church tonight, so forgive me for the slightly different view. Uh, I've got a music stand in front of me with my phone on it, so I think you're going to be looking at my goatee most of the night. But I'm doing that because we've um, invited folks to join us in person if they would like. There are just a couple of us here right now, but it being 701 or 702, you never know who might roll in. So I see a few of you are already logged on. Um, I'm not getting notifications, so if somebody wanted to try a comment and say hello, uh, I could see who you are, and that's always helpful to me. But glad that you're here with us. I'm going to just kind of give folks a couple of moments to join. Oh, I see Julie Ash. Thanks for joining us, Julie. Good to see you here. Beth Bovin is watching. Always good. Oh, Shirley Redford is watching. Hey, Shirley, good to see you. Glad you're here. Um, going to just kind of give us a, a couple of minutes to see who else might join, either online or in person. We've got a uh, kind of a hybrid thing going on tonight. I see Brenda Dubell online. Uh, there you are. There you are. <laughs> Shannon Saunders, I see you. Good to see you tonight. Um... We are gonna do a story and song tonight, um, but uh, my format's gonna be a little bit different. We're actually gonna do the song first and then the story. So if you wanna do song and story, I guess we're going backwards. That's how we're gonna do it. Um, but uh, just so you know, there we are. Let's pause and have a word of prayer. Ask God as we always do when we look to his word to give us wisdom and insight as we examine the scriptures and just, um, Open, open our minds to that. Before I say uh, the beginning of the prayer, I want to say a quick hi to Deb Sanchez, who I see there. Good to see you, Deb. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this night. Thanks for calling us and gathering us in a few different places now. I pray, Lord, that you would open our ears to hear your words tonight. I pray, Lord, that this song and this story would be well chosen um, and just Lord, that they would convey what, you, what your spirit is saying to us. Help us to understand the words that we read tonight and help us to grow in our understanding of you, your character, and your love for us. I thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A hello to what I presume to be two Connies who are watching tonight, I believe from out of state. So thank you, ladies, for logging on and good to see you all. I'm um, going to talk a little bit tonight about a song uh, that was written um, for an event that, uh, we're, it's, it's going to be a David song, but it's for an event that David would never see, and he knew it when he wrote it. Um, sometimes we write songs about things that we believe are going to happen or things that we know are going to happen. Uh, music has uh, the ability to to convey, of course, emotion and, and all sorts of thoughts and, and, and things to future generations. And David, like most songwriters, occasionally wrote for those who would come behind him. Um, I reason to bet that, um, is that a phrase, reason to bet? I don't know, I'll have to look into that. Yeroa, good to see you. Robert Durbin, good to see you. Uh, but I, I, I would wager that, that most songwriters at one point or another have written uh, with future generations in mind. And I would wager that most parents have a favorite song that reminds them of a message that they want to kind of leave in legacy format for their children. Um, so perhaps tonight's song is going to speak to the, the parent heart in some of us, whether, whether we're parents or not. I think we all have that that sense of, of legacy at one point or another, what we're leaving for those who come behind. David certainly was like that. And our secular um, songwriters of today, uh, songwriters in today's world are like that. I made a quick list. Um, this is another one where I didn't have to hunt too long to come up with a good example because there's a lot of classic examples of songwriters that wrote songs for, for their children or for children in general, those who would come behind. Um, if you can think of one, feel free to throw it in the comment section there. Um, John Lennon, I did a Beatles song last, last week, but how about John Lennon's uh, Beautiful Boy? Um, definitely a song for, for his son. Leanne Womack, 
for the uh, pop country fans out there. I hope you dance, right? Leanne Womack, what a beautiful song she did. How about, and I actually didn't know this until I started searching it. Maybe you, you knew it. You're probably smarter than I am on this. But Stevie Wonder, Isn't She Lovely, is a song he actually wrote uh, first for his daughter, Isn't She Lovely. Um, and I remember when I was, oh my goodness, in grade school or junior high or so, um, Whitney Houston's hit, The Greatest Love. You remember, I believe the children are the future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. I wasn't planning to sing that, but I uh, couldn't, couldn't help myself. Um, I wonder if anybody has a, a favorite of theirs. Um, the one, though, that I did write the lyrics down, and I, I have it on my notes over here, Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, Satchmo, right? What a beautiful world. Um, the last verse of that says, I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, everybody sing it together now. Do, do your best Louis Armstrong impersonation wherever you are right now. What a wonderful world. Sadly, that was my best. Cat Hall, good to see you tonight. I'm sorry that you logged in just in time to hear that abomination, uh, but thanks for joining us anyhow. Um, yeah, songs that we write for our children or for the generations that come next. Tonight's story and song probably fits that category. It probably deals with a similar situation to some of those that I just mentioned. Uh, a father composing a song about a time or an event that he knew he wouldn't be alive for. Probably. I'll explain later why I'm saying probably. Um, but because of that probably, <clears throat> excuse me while I get my water here. That uh, Satchmo impersonation just didn't sit well with me there. Renee Latsky, good to see you tonight. Thanks for joining us. Um, probably, I think tonight's story and song probably fit that category, but because I'm only able to say probably, it's actually going to be helpful for us to do, as I said earlier, um, uh, reverse the order and, and do the song first and the story next. Julie Ash, Nat King Cole and Natalie Cole, perfect example, right? Father and daughter. That's a good one. Hadn't thought of that one. That set, certainly fits that kind of generational idea. Um, so we're going to do the song, and we're looking at the Psalms again, and it's going to be Psalm 30 tonight. So I'll give you just a minute. Hopefully you have a Bible with you or an app open that you can use. Psalm 30 is where I'm headed. As you get to Psalm 30, you will see that, um, that first line that we've encountered so many times in these stories and song, that, uh, what do they call it? Inscription, I guess would be the word. The inscription about what this is for. I've said it every time, I'll say it again. Hopefully you know already. This is original text. So this, this line at the beginning that doesn't have a verse number, it's not verse one, is the original text. When this song was originally written down or originally compiled at least, I'll put it that way, um, this is part of the original text, and therefore it's reliable. It's what we consider to be, um, you know, a part, of, a part of the scripture. So hopefully you found it now. Psalm 30 begins before the song lyrics. The inscription reads, a psalm, a song. I won't get into what the difference is uh, there. It's, it's, it's not terribly relevant. Uh, but it's a psalm, it's a song, and it's for the dedication of the temple. And then it gives us that word of David. Now, I've referenced before um, that when the psalm says it's of David, or sometimes they say of Solomon, or it might be of someone else, that doesn't necessarily mean that David wrote it. In this study, I've picked psalms that I think we're fairly confident David actually literally was the one doing the writing of. Um, but it's worth repeating and just remembering that when it says of David, it could mean that it was, uh, that, that preposition there, of, is not, it doesn't translate well. So does it mean it's of David or does it mean it was for David? Could it have been written by David or could it have been written by someone else and given to David? All of those are linguistically possible with what that word means. It also might mean that it was written in the style of David, just like I did a bad impersonation of Louis 
Armstrong. Um, other songwriters would have done impersonations, not really impersonations, but they would have written in, in the style or in the manner of, of David. So we have a song here for the dedication of the temple, and it, it's attributed to David. A uh, quick shout out to Barb Kennedy. Thanks for joining us tonight, Barb. I want to talk about temple here. It says, for the dedication of the temple. Now, I'm reading from the New International Version. We have a translation issue here. If, if you're reading from another version, it probably says temple. I didn't go through a, a number of versions to look at, um, but it, it might use a different word there. And the reason is, the word there that, that many translators have chosen to translate temple is actually the generic word for house which is in fact the word that they would use for temple because the temple is God's house. So it's for the dedication of, if we're going to take this very, very literally, it says this is a psalm song for the dedication of the house. And it's attributed to David. So we have kind of a question right there, which is going to figure into the probably in my, in my story here. It's... Um, a song for the dedication of the house, and the question then becomes, whose house? Uh, are we dedicating David's house, or are we dedicating God's house? It seems unlikely that it was for the dedication of David's neighbor's house, or, or something like that. Um, but it's either David's or God's, and then if we look at the lifetime of David, and try and figure out when David um, potentially could have been dedicating houses, uh, be they his own or God's, there's really three possibilities that um, kind of leap out at us as, as potentials. And the first is this. It certainly could be, and the most literal reading might infer that it's a song for the dedication of David's personal residence. Uh, and we would be thinking here of the royal palace when he um, established the capital in Jerusalem. That didn't happen right at the beginning of his reign. Uh, we referenced a couple of weeks ago that when King David became the king, it actually was a number of years before he was the king over a unified Israel, and it wasn't until that point that he moved the capital city to Jerusalem. Uh, but the Bible does tell the story of the building of his palace there in 2 Samuel chapter 5, uh, and the story is repeated um, in, in 1 Chronicles 14, often Samuel and Kings and Chronicles kind of tell the same stories. We have multiple authors telling the same thing. So it could be the dedication of David's personal residence. Um, however, there's no record in the Bible of there being a dedication ceremony. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. There's just, there's no record of that. So we don't have a place specifically to put this song, if indeed it is a song for the dedication of his house. Um, scenario number two is it could be a song for the tabernacle. The tabernacle was like the temple, but it was the mobile temple made of tents um, that was established long before David in the time of Moses, but it was still in use in the time of David. And, and you'll remember, because we just talked about it a few weeks ago, while the tabernacle would have been in use and therefore wouldn't exactly have been dedicated during David's lifetime, there was that story about recovering the Ark of the Covenant, which was God's presence, and bringing it to rest once again where it should rest, which was in, in the tabernacle. Uh, you can read that story in 2 Samuel chapter 6 or in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Now, that's a possibility, in, in my opinion. It's not the most likely scenario um, because, uh, as I said, the tabernacle had been in existence. So they wouldn't have exactly been dedicating the tabernacle. They might have been celebrating the return of the ark. But you and I already talked about that story in song. So this one doesn't seem to fit very well there. Plus, the Old Testament has a word for tabernacle. And this isn't it. When it says dedication of the house, it says dedication of the house. It doesn't say dedication of the tabernacle. So that one seems unlikely to me as well. The third scenario, which is um, kind of where I'm going to arrive, is that the house that's being dedicated in, in this psalm is in fact the permanent temple that David wanted to build. And we read in 2 Samuel chapter 7, or if you prefer, in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, 
that David desired to build um, a permanent structure, the, the, the first temple that would actually be a temple for God's people. The, the problem with that scenario, even though that's the one I, you know, I personally subscribe to, the problem with that scenario is David never actually built that house. He wasn't allowed to build that house, and, and we'll get into the whys and, and how that part of the story takes place later. But if you're saying, as I would tend to say, Psalm 30, dedication of the house, is probably a reference to the dedication of the temple, the gaping hole in that theory is that David never got to dedicate the temple because he never got to build the temple. And so maybe that doesn't make quite so much sense either. So in fairness, there's problems with all three of these scenarios. But as I've already said, I think scenario number three works well, and I'll explain why. So in a moment, I'm going to begin reading Psalm 30. But just before I do that, I want to say a quick hello to Melissa Wagner and thank her for joining us. And for Terry Nelson, uh, old friend of HRCC, who says, hey, from Georgia, Terry, it's good to see you. Hope you're doing well and staying safe and healthy down there in Georgia. We miss you here in Downers Grove. Um, Psalm 30, as I said, I've gone through the scenarios, so we didn't have our story yet. We're starting tonight with the song, and here it is. Psalm 30, verse 1 reads as follows. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. I'm going to pause there and let's just talk for a couple of minutes about that part of the song. David, this sounds like David, doesn't it? It sounds like the other songs that we've looked at in the last few weeks. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it says of David, but it almost doesn't need to say that. It just sounds like him. Um, he begins with personal experience, um, which, you know, the fact that he's making this song so personal, maybe if you didn't think what I think, Maybe you would say, well, that's evidence that it, it must not be for an event that he knows he's not going to be at. Um, you know, maybe you would say, this sounds a lot more personal. This doesn't sound like the kind of song that he would be writing to his son for the dedication of a building that he knows he's not going to build. Uh, if you happen to say that, I would honor your opinion. But I would respond... I think that the personal experiences of the king in general in ancient Israel and in the ancient Near East, what happens to the king is seen as a, a metaphor for what happens to the nation. The, the, as goes the king, especially as it pertains to God, right? As goes the king, so goes the nation. We read that in the books of, you know, the, the two Samuel books and the two Kings books and the two Chronicles books. They tell us again and again, the king served the Lord well and the nation did well. Or conversely, they tell us the king ignored God and the nation suffered. The nation didn't have a healthy relationship with God. So I don't think there's really a problem with David writing a song for the nation and talking about his own experience that seems to be pretty, pretty consistent with how things would have worked in their minds. And even more so, I mean, if that was ever true for any king, it's going to be true for David because he is the prototype king of the covenant of God's people. And we'll get more into that David covenant a little bit later. So his story isn't just the story of, uh, it wouldn't just be seen as Israel's story during his time, right? His story would be, part of Israel's story for all time, collectively forever. So it's, it's, it's his personal experience, but I, I think that makes, in my opinion, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, listen to some of the lines. Lifted from the depths. Um, he said, uh, you did not let my enemies gloat over me. Uh, that, that sounds a lot like some of the experiences David had. I think we won't have any trouble locating that song, you know, what's in David's mind as he's thinking about that? Is it, 
you know, when he's running from Saul? Is it when he's getting tattletailed on by Doeg? Remember, we talked about Doeg a few weeks ago. Is it when Absalom is rebelling against him and the whole nation is turning over to Absalom? There's so many instances in David's life that we could imagine him thinking about and using those words about being lifted out of the depths, maybe even the literal depths, the cave in Agilom. This We have no problem reading this song and saying, yep, that's David. Quick hello to Rick Coleman. Thanks for joining in tonight, Rick. Um, he uses the word healed there, which certainly infers or implies um, physical disease, and it sounds like life-threatening. Uh, he, he uses the phrase realm of the dead. At least that's how the NIV translates it. It's really just one word, uh, and perhaps you've heard it before. Sheol, which is the, the Hebrew word for the grave and is very common um, in any kind of reference to dying that you would go down to Sheol. Uh, he says pit, which is a, a literal pit, you know, like, like you would dig a hole in the ground. But it's a, just a poetic metaphor for the grave. And he's saying, God, you didn't let me go down there. So it sounds like David's thinking about a time in his life to die. Um, it sounds like David is, is, is thinking about that time. Now, we can of times in David's life as it, pertains to, um, as it pertains to danger on the battlefield or people going after him. I don't know that we can pinpoint a time when he was sick and at death's door. Uh, but... You know, whatever. I think this still works. Look at verse 4. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Okay? We started with personal testimony, right? The first three words were, let me tell you my story. And then here in verse 4 and 5, David saying, So having heard my story, everybody praise the Lord. That's good theology there. Personal experiences become a call to worship. When I know, when I recall what God has done in my life, that gives me motivation and strength and kind of a foundation to say, So come praise the Lord with me. And I think there's a good lesson for us here. Testimony, I'm going to give you... A, some, some big words here, some nerd words. Testimony begets doxology. When we use the word doxology, maybe some of you have worshipped in church traditions where you sang the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Um, and so on and so forth. The word doxology uh, means words that glorify God, presumably. Um, so testimony uh, begets or turns into doxology. When I tell you what God has done in my life by um, just the very nature of that activity, it's going to cause me to praise the Lord. Uh, if I do it well, it's going to cause you to praise the Lord. Um, likely, as, as the Spirit uses that moment, it's going to cause other people to praise the Lord. Uh, this is why telling your story is so important. I encourage you to remember that. You know, we, we, we talk in church sometimes about sharing your testimony or telling your story. Um, that's really an important part of the Christian lifestyle. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a formal setting with a microphone um, and, and a, a bunch of people gathered, but just the habit of being able to, to tell your story it's not just for your own good, but part of what we're seeing here in Psalm 30 is when you tell your story, that turns into praise. God gets the glory, which is, uh, again, literally what that word doxology has to do with. God gets the glory when you tell your story. Uh, good to see Aiden joining us online. Uh, hope to see you soon, Aiden. Verse 6 says, When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. Um, verse 6, when I felt secure, I will never be shaken. That's David confessing. He's not explaining how things worked. He's confessing that when he felt secure, when he felt like everything was good, then he pridefully said, I will never be shaken. 
Nothing can touch me. I'm the king. I got the biggest army. I got the biggest palace. I'm all good to go. I, when I felt secure, I said, nothing's going to touch me. But then in verse 7, he acknowledges that he had to learn a different truth. Lord, when you favored me, you were the one who made me secure. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. What does David have to tell us here about our security? Where does security come from? That's what these two verses are about. David's saying, if I could put words in his mouth, I feel like he's saying, look, I know what it is to be on top of the world. I was the king. I am the king. I had everything that a king could want or a king could need or a king could have. And it was easy to presume that that's what made me strong. That's what made me safe. That's what made me powerful. But I had to learn the lesson that those things go away like this. That my security doesn't come from my stuff. My confidence doesn't come from my assessment of the world around me. My, confident, my, um, my confidence comes from my strength comes from God's favor. When God's hand is on me, nothing can touch me. But when my relationship with God is such that we are distant, he says, I was dismayed. Then I learned that not all the palaces and not all the armies in the world could keep me safe. Good lesson. So let's keep reading the song, uh, picking up on verse eight. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. So again here, he's, he's talking about this kind of near-death experience. And is David thinking about one particular time in his life? Or is he thinking about perhaps the many times um, that he felt that his life was in danger? I, I would speculate that it's more the latter. Um, let me tell you a couple of things here because I think this, this stanza is really interesting. In verse eight, to you, Lord, I called, to the Lord, I cried for mercy. Those verbs, call and cried, they are um, in a tense that, that we don't have in English. What's, what they're saying there, what they're literally saying is, I kept on calling. He's not saying to you, Lord, I called out once right? But there's this, uh, a specific verb tense he's using there that tells us, I called and I kept on calling. I called and I kept on calling. I'm laughing because um, Sue was telling me uh, a, a couple of days ago about um, before years before we were married, thank God, some guy that had a crush on her that, that called her one day. And as a, as a nurse, she worked the night shift. So calling her in the day, she was asleep. Uh, but of course, the phone woke her up, but she didn't answer it. And this guy called her again and again and again. He called and kept calling. And um, he did not get a date with her because she did not. She was not blessed by that experience. That's what David's saying here. I called and I kept on calling. I cried out and I kept on crying out. Uh, it reminds me of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. When you pray, you don't pray once and say, all right, God, God's been put on notice. He knows, you know. No, we're supposed to pray without ceasing. And that's kind of what, what David's saying he did here. I called and I kept on calling. I cried and I kept on crying. What is gained if I'm silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Really interesting prayer. Don't you think? David is pleading with God, but he's arguing his case from a standpoint of, God, what, what's in your interest here? What's in your benefit? You know, if I die, God, I can't praise you anymore. You know, if I die, I can't glorify you in this, in this life, on this earth anymore. So isn't it, God, in your best interest to, to keep me alive here, to rescue me, to, to save me? Very interesting prayer. Um, does it sound to your ears to be a little bit manipulative? Like, doesn't that sound a little odd? Perhaps, 
But I wonder, and I would submit, isn't this really another example of David allowing his very intimate knowledge of God's character to shape his prayers? So he's not trying to manipulate God, like saying, you know, God, if you do this thing, it's not going to work out so good for you. Um, I don't think he's doing that. I don't think that's consistent with David's character. I do think that David is saying, God, I can pray this prayer because I know what's important to you, because I know what your priority is. Okay? Now, that might sound, if, if we weren't good students of the Bible, if we weren't good, uh, what do we say, BE is Bible exploration, if we weren't good explorers of the Bible, we might come away from that and say, ah, therefore, anytime I'm in trouble, I'm just going to remind God that he pretty much has to save me from my trouble because otherwise he's going to end up looking bad. Um, that would be really a bad take from this. Uh, we do see examples of that. Remember in the Old Testament, God says to Moses, you know, I'm, I'm going to destroy the Israelites and, and, and just kind of start over. And Moses says, God, don't do that. And one of the reasons he gives is think about your own reputation. You know, what will the nation say about you if you were strong enough to get the Israelites out of Egypt, but not strong enough to deliver them to the promised land? Um, there's times that we can see in the Bible where men and women remind God in their prayers of what's in his best interests. But of course, we're not actually reminding God. It's not like God forgot that. It's not like God didn't know it in the first place. Um, I think we remind ourselves sometimes that our prayers need to be focused on God's will. And here's the tricky thing about that. The circumstance of Moses leading the Israelites into the promised land or what's in view in this psalm with David uh, talking about his own life, those are unique circumstances. When I say unique, I don't mean that they're unusual. Uh, I suppose taking Israelites through the wilderness is unusual. I'm not, I'm, what I mean is, that's not the only time that it would be in God's best interest to, to save you or keep you alive. But I just mean there's specific instances. And what we need to remember is that what matters most in every instance, in every circumstance, what matters most is that God gets the glory. That's our bottom line here. What matters most, no matter what you're facing, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in right now, what matters most is that God gets the glory. And fortunately for you and I, if we have, um, well, I won't even qualify it. Fortunately for you and I, that means oftentimes that we're going to benefit from that. Because if God gets the glory, oftentimes we're going to, we're going to benefit from that. That's the good news. But the reminder here, I think, that's important is that sometimes God is actually glorified better through our suffering or through our difficulties. And I can think of a number of examples in scripture when that would be the case. I wonder if you have in mind some as well. Feel free to comment if something comes to mind. But Jesus himself in John chapter 12, as he's facing the garden, prays, you know, God, I'm, I'm not going to ask, or he, he says, I'm not going to ask for God to deliver me. Because God delivering me would be contrary to the whole purpose of me coming, which was that God would be glorified. Um, I think also from the book of John, chapter 9 tells the story of Christ healing the man born blind. Remember the story, uh, they bring him the man born blind. Is he born blind because he sinned or was it because his parents sinned? And in, in the minds of the disciples and the others in the crowd that day, those were really the only two viable scenarios. And Jesus is like, it doesn't have anything to do with either one of those things. He was born that, this way so that my power could be demonstrated in him. Now, we interpret that as a good story because a blind man got to see, right? But think about the challenges that that man lived through for his life life up to that point. Uh, he suffered. I'm sure he suffered. Sometimes God is glorified better in our suffering. Paul said, 
look, I'll boast, but I'm going to boast about my weaknesses. And he talks about all the things that he did poorly. Elsewhere, Paul talks about how bad a preacher he is. And he said, it's got to be God. It's got to be the Holy Spirit working. The only way, there's other preachers out there, Paul says, I'm paraphrasing here, you know, that, that you hear them preach and they're so good, they get the glory. Paul says, come hear me preach. I'm so bad, only God could possibly get the glory. You see, sometimes it's our weaknesses. Sometimes it's our suffering. Sometimes it's our detriment is, is the place where, where God gets the most glory. Uh, I think, you know, I want to give you an encouraging word. I don't think that that's usually the case. But we need to be aware of the fact that sometimes that is the case. So David finishes up his song here. We're getting close to the end of the song. Um, verse 11 of Psalm 30. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Sackcloth would have been a traditional um, uh, the garb of a mourner. Uh, you removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. And that's the end of the song. And I feel like, as we've seen with so many of David's psalms, this is just the, the tag at the end that sums it all up. He says, God, in light of all you've done, I will praise you forever. In light of all you've done, he, he, he listed it, right? He started with his own personal testimony. He talked about, um, you know, he, he encouraged people to, to praise with him. Come, come and rejoice with me. Sing the praises of the Lord. He talked about the, the mistakes that he had made along the way. Um, he talked about the, um, you know, with the whole, when I, when I felt secure, I, I made this assumption, but then I had to learn this. He talked about his, his own prayers for mercy and, and how he, he had to seek out, um, you know, God's will in the midst of, of all of that. He's gone through a whole lot of his own experience and put it into this song that's to be used for the dedication, and, and we're headed there now, of, of the house. Um, it just, to me, and I'm not telling you what the Bible says, don't take this and etch it in stone somewhere, but you want to know my opinion? Uh, to me, it sounds a whole lot like a dad leaving some words of wisdom to those who will come behind him. Um, here's my story, kids. Try and learn what you can from it, that kind of a thing. And, and as we said at the very beginning tonight, we, we find that in music all the time. So here we have perhaps a biblical example. Um, before I transition, I want to say a quick hello to Sandra Miller and Rolf Stivey who have joined us along the way. Thank you, guys. So we just read Psalm 30, um, working backwards tonight, started with the song. Um, I want to, again, just kind of quickly review. We don't know exactly what this song goes with. We're not sure which story to pair with the song. So tonight's study of story and song is a little bit of investigative journalism, because we're not sure. It just says it's for the dedication of and the word there, as I said, is of, of the house. Some Bible translators have presumptively said temple, which is allowable. We would have called the temple in those days the house, meaning God's house. But it's not necessarily the temple. It could be most anything. I gave you the three possibilities at the beginning. If, if you didn't hear that or if you weren't on, um, go back when we're done and when it posts and, and you can kind of review those three possibilities. Uh, and I told you, I think it's scenario number three. Um, and again, just, just to review, having now read the song, I told you some of the problems with each of the three scenarios. But having now read the song, um, scenario number one that says, you know, David wrote this song for the dedication of his personal palace. And scenario number two that says, well, he wrote it when they brought the ark back to the tabernacle. And so it was a celebration or a dedication, a rededication, perhaps, of the tabernacle. In those two scenarios, are they possible? Yeah, they're absolutely possible. But in my opinion, those two things happened relatively early in David's reign. He was, um, the kingdom was, was just only recently established under his, his rule. And I just wonder, 
given the song that we just read together that seems to chronicle some very broad experiences and life lessons. I just wonder, that early in David's reign, is it likely that he would have had the perspective that is conveyed in this song? And as I've already said, my personal opinion is maybe not, probably not. On the other hand, scenario number three allows for the possibility, if this is in fact a song that David wrote for the dedication of the temple, which is an event that he knew, because God told him, he knew was never going to happen in his lifetime. He would never be able to experience it. If in fact he wrote this song for that event, well then he's got his whole life to write this song. Uh, perhaps it was written much later in his life. Perhaps by the time he, he penned these lyrics, he had a lot more experience to draw upon. Maybe he had a greater sense, um, as people do as they approach the latter years of their life, a greater sense of what legacy do I want to leave behind? What lessons do uh, I want those who come behind me to take from the life I've lived? And I just feel personally, like this song speaks to some of those things, which is one of the reasons I think, and I'm not alone by this, you know, obviously a lot of translators just assume he's talking about the dedication of capital T, the temple. Um, but that's why we think that. That's why we think that. You don't have to think that. But to see if maybe you agree with me, let's now work backwards, having already addressed the song, let's go to the story. And the story of, of the dedication of the temple. Which, of course, as I've said a hundred times already tonight, David wasn't actually at. So let me give you the background. Let me give you the background. In both 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 1 Chronicles 17, we read the same story in both chapters. And the story is that early in his reign, when David established the capital city in Jerusalem... He built his house, we referenced that. He got the Ark of the Covenant and returned it uh, to the tabernacle, we referenced that. But then he said, excuse me, then he said, I want to build a temple. I want to build a permanent structure for worship. It'll be God's house and it's going to be right here in Jerusalem and it will be the place for national worship. And so David had this great idea. However, we're told in both of the chapters that I referenced that a prophet by the name of Nathan informed David that God did not want David to build that temple. I'm going to read to you from 1 Chronicles chapter 17, beginning in verse 10. This is Nathan speaking on God's behalf. I declare to you that I, Yahweh, will build a house for you. Um, David was saying, Yahweh, I want to build a house for you. And, and Yahweh says, you're not going to build my house. I'm going to build your house. When your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. These uh, verses that I just read to you, I, again, reading from 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 10 through 14. Um, these verses are part of what we call the Davidic co covenant. Davidic because it refers to David, and covenant meaning the terms of the, the covenant arrangement, uh, the structure by which our relationship with God would work. God worked through covenants, and at various times in history, usually associated with a particular person such as David, or before him Moses, or before him Abraham, God would um, expand or clarify, or, or I think expand is a good word, the covenant he had with mankind. And so what I just read to you is, is part of the Davidic covenant. And God is saying, I am going to build your house and I am going to use uh, you, your offspring, 
I will establish his kingdom. Your offspring is going to build my temple and your offspring will be on the throne forever and ever. I'll be his father, he'll be my son, um, and he, he will reign for all time. Now, this is the, settle in, because this is good stuff here. It starts to sound like he's talking about Solomon, doesn't it? Your, your offspring, he says your son, is going to do this thing. He's going to build my temple. And we know, most of you already know the end of the story, Solomon is the one who built the temple. But we need to bear in mind that, that the language here in, in their time and in their culture doesn't necessarily mean, when, when, when God says son, it doesn't necessarily mean first generation son. Um, it could also be understood, and I think it's better understood, as your descendant, okay? And so what we have here is something that we see so often in Old Testament prophecy. So often in Old Testament prophecy, there's a fulfillment of the prophecy in the relatively near term. And then there's a much greater, more profound fulfillment of the prophecy in the long term. So in this case, in the near term, David's going to have a son who will build the temple, Solomon, right? But in the long term, there's a much greater, more profound fulfillment of the prophecy. David's going to have a son that is a descendant who will establish God's house, who will build the temple, okay, this is a reference to Jesus. Now, Jesus never constructed a building, okay? But Jesus uh, established the temple. I, look, I could go on for hours here. You guys know where I'm headed with this. This is a reference to Jesus. And long before the time of Jesus, the Jews pointed to this passage as one of the reasons that they expected the Messiah to be a descendant of King David because they knew that that was part of God's promise. So we see here what we see so many cases in the Bible. Prophecy can be fulfilled in the near term, um, and then it can be fulfilled in a more profound way in the long term. Just quickly, one other example, in case you're not buying what I'm selling. Let me tell you one quick example. Do you remember the story of Abraham taking his son Isaac up the top of the mountain where there was gonna be a sacrifice? In that story, Isaac says to Abraham, we've got the wood for the altar, we've got the knife, we've got everything we need here, but I couldn't help but noticing, I couldn't help but notice, we don't have a lamb for the offering. And Abraham's response to Isaac, which from the beginning of, of recorded Israelite history was, was understood to be prophetic, Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide a lamb. And if you knew the story, there's a fulfillment of that prophecy in the short term where there's the ram caught in the thicket and that's, that's the sacrificial lamb. But there's a much more profound truth in the long term that God is the one that provides the sacrificial lamb. So many times we see that that's how prophecy works. And in terms of David's plan to build a temple, I think we're looking at a classic example of this. The point for our purposes, though, if you'll forgive me that very long tangent, long but really compelling, don't you think? Um, the point for our purposes is that David never built the temple. The prophet said, this isn't for you to do, this is for your son to do, and David said, all right, so I'm not going to build the temple. But I want to highlight for you, and I'm going to go quickly through Chronicles here, you're probably not going to be able to keep up with me, but I'm going to go quickly here um, and highlight for you just what did David do in reference to that temple? He didn't build the temple, but the Bible says that David actually chose the site for the temple and that he was the first to worship on that site long before the temple was built. The story there, uh, and I referenced this in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, late in David's reign, there was, a, there was a plague on the land of Israel that was a result of God's judgment on his sin. And when David repented of that sin, God instructed him to build an altar at a very specific place. He had to build an altar uh, and worship at a very, very specific location 
The problem was that that location didn't belong to David and he had to go to a guy and, and, and buy the land from him. You might recall me telling this story recently. It's the whole thing where the guy offers to just give David the land and David says, no, I won't sacrifice that which costs me nothing. In any case, in that story, um, which you can read uh, in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, um, David makes that sacrifice and forward here. It says, at that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Arauna the Jebusite, that's the guy, he offered sacrifices there. The tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness and the altar of burnt offering, were at that time in the high places at Gibeon. In other words, that's not where the tabernacle was at the time, but that's where God told David to build an altar and worship. But David couldn't go there to inquire of God because he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord, which is a reference to the plague that was going on. So instead, David worships in this very specific place and look at chapter 22, verse one. Then David said, the house of the Lord God is to be here and also the altar of burnt offering for Israel. And indeed, that's exactly where they built the temple. So David didn't build the temple, but he's the one who picked out with guidance from God. He's the one who picked out the site, the site and was actually the first one to ever worship there. Pretty cool. Trivia question, perhaps. Who was the first person to ever worship on the site of the temple? Well, it was actually David. So he didn't just do that. David also prefabricated much of the building material for the temple. I'm going to read to you quickly here. First Chronicles chapter 22. Verse two, so David gave orders to assemble the foreigners residing in Israel and from among them he appointed stone cutters to prepare dressed stone for building the house of God. He provided a large amount of iron to make nails for the doors of the gateways and for the fittings and more bronze than could be weighed. He also provided more cedar logs than could be counted for the Sidonians and Tyrrhenians had bought large numbers of them to David. David said, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced, like every father ever, right? My son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all the nations. Therefore, I will make the preparations for it. So David made extensive preparations before his death. In other words, and this is a whole other story we don't get into, the, the, the temple was prefab. It was prefabbed. All the supplies were there. They were measured. They were cut. They were all ready to go because that's what David spent a lot of his time working on. Not only that, you say, oh, that's enough. But I say not only that, but also apparently David made detailed blueprints and work orders for the temple, which he passed on to Solomon before his death. I'm going real quick now. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 11. David gave his son Solomon the plans for the portico of the temple, its buildings, its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, and the place of atonement. He gave Solomon the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and the surrounding rooms, for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries of the dedicated things. He gave Solomon instructions for the divisions of the priests and the Levites, and for all the work of serving in the temple of the Lord, as well as for all the articles to be used in its service. He designated the weight of gold for all the gold articles to be used in various kinds of service, and the weight of the silver for all the silver articles to be used in various kinds of service, the weight of gold for the gold lampstands and their lamps, with the weight of each lampstand and its lamps, the weight of each silver for the... Could, could I, do you get the idea here? And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. Verse 19, all this, David said, I have in writing, in writing, he's got blueprints. All this, David said, I have in writing as a result of the Lord's hand on me. And he enabled me to understand all the details of the plan. David had written blueprints for the temple. He passed them on to Solomon. Not only that, oh, I'm not done yet. Not only that, but David planned his personal estate. I don't mean his house. I'm talking about his financial holdings. David had a guy at, at, at Merrill Lynch that helped him plan his personal estate so that at time of death, he would leave an endowment for the temple that would be above and beyond what the government had already paid for. If that sounds like modern politics, it's not. This is how it worked in ancient Israel too. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse three, David says, this is close to the end of his life. He says, besides in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give 
my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God, over and above everything I have provided for this holy temple. 3,000 talents of gold, that's the gold of Ophir if you wanted to do the calculations, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls and the buildings, for the gold work and the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Okay, I really am done now with all that. Here's my point. David chose the site. David made the blueprints. David prefabbed the building materials. David hired the laborers. David left instruction. And David even partially funded the project out of his own pocket. So isn't it likely that this old songwriter also wrote a tune for the event? I think it is. And if I'm right about that, then I'm going to say let's take the song that we just heard and let's pair it with this story from 2 Chronicles now, chapter 7, verse 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 tells the story of David's son, King Solomon, who has now completed the construction of the temple. And this is the story of the dedication of the temple. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, it says that Solomon led in prayer, but I'm just going to read to you from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, he is good, his love endures forever. And I'm just gonna skip down just a couple of lines to verse five. So the king, we're talking about Solomon now, the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their positions as, as did the Levites with the Lord's musical instruments, hmm, which King David had made for praising the Lord and which were used when he gave thanks, saying his love endures forever. Opposite the Levites, the priests blew their trumpets and all the Israelites were standing. Look, we didn't even mention in the list I said a, a, a minute ago, but apparently in addition to all the other things, David also made the instruments that would be used uh, when the band played. At, at the dedication of the temple. But think about this story I just read. Second Chronicles chapter seven. We have the dedication of a temple, right? We have musical instruments there. We have worship. Uh, it uses the word worship. We have crowds of people kneeling, praising God. We have crowds of people standing and rising in celebration. Can you picture that? And more so than picturing that, can you hear that? Can you imagine what that sounded like, and I just ask you that question, is it possible, don't you think, that among the songs that the band played that day was Psalm 30? I think it was. And with this, we're gonna just kind of wrap up what we're gonna say tonight. I wanted to do this in reverse order tonight, first of all, to kind of just have some fun with the investigative journalism part of this song, what, what exactly is the event we're, we're talking about. And I've been pretty clear about that. But also, much of the scripture that I read, especially when I was going real quick there a few minutes ago, are the kinds of stories in scripture that aren't really stories. They're some of the things that, that we might read and think, my goodness, is that boring? What does that have to do with anything? Because I was reading to you um, building material lists. I was reading to you, you know, lists of what kind of wood and what kind of gold and what kind of silver and, and iron and, and things like that. Um, it's supply lists to take to Home Depot. I was reading to you uh, the information, what would equate to blueprints, and, and mercifully I didn't get into all of that kind of stuff, but right in there you have the descriptions of what size things are. And, and how many cubits until you get to the stadia or, or you know, whatever. I was reading to you financial statements that, that were talking about what everything cost. And a lot of that is the kind of stuff that we just kind of read through thinking what, you know, okay, I get it. It costs a lot. What's the point? And those passages of scripture sometimes on their own 
it's hard for us to find the significance behind them. But in this case, we have a song. And the song helps us understand that all of that stuff, all of that stuff is part of the story of a godly man who was preparing his son for a task that the father knew he would never be a part of. And there's a real legacy issue with that. And I just want to say this. Here's a conclusion that I'm going to draw from that. The work of the ministry, whether you're a pastor or a congregant or anybody else, if, if you are part of the body of Christ, then you are involved in the work of the ministry. And the truth is that the work of the ministry is not always exciting. The work of the ministry doesn't always make a good story. The work of the ministry is not always memorable. Oftentimes, here's the other truth about ministry. Oftentimes, the work of the ministry involves preparing for things that we are never going to see, preparing for things that we aren't going to be able to participate in. The metaphor that the Bible uses here is sometimes God calls us to plant seeds or to water seeds that we are never going to harvest. And that's just what ministry is like. But God has given us in those experiences the gift of a song, the gift of a song that can help us remember that we are participating in something far greater than what we'll see. And I just want to leave that with you tonight as a word, hopefully, of encouragement. If you find yourself in the midst of your obedience to God, living through a, a, a dry period. I don't mean dry in terms of your relationship with the Lord, but I just mean dry in terms of you sometimes wonder, God, is this really what you had for me? If you feel yourself in, in that experience now, or if you ever do, I want you to remember David's song. I want you to remember, I believe that his story is part of your story. And likewise, yours is part of his. That's how... Um, the community of God's people was meant to work. The song is always, the work isn't always exciting, but the song is always a song of promise. It's always a song of deliverance. It's always a song of praise. And so I invite you to sing that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder tonight that the work that we put our hands to for the purposes of your kingdom oftentimes is meant to echo and reverberate in generations in which we will not walk. And Lord, we together as the, the, the people that are um, experiencing this tonight, perhaps someday folks will refer to us as the COVID generation. Be that as it may, Lord, we together lift up to you those who will come behind us. Lord Jesus, for as many years as you tarry, for as long as it takes for this earth to see your promised second coming, I pray, Lord, that your children would be faithful about the work that you've given to them. And I pray, Lord, that you would use our generation to prepare well for those who will come behind us. Just as we have thanked you again and again for calling us, I pray, Lord, a prayer of thanksgiving for calling them. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, most of you are online, but thank you for joining us tonight as well. And we will look forward to doing this the same way next Tuesday night. Of course, for the HRCC family, we also have the opportunity to worship together in person this coming Sunday morning. And I look forward to seeing many of you there should you choose to be a part of that gathering. Bless you tonight.